good uh, late morning to every one of you. Thanks for showing up. I'll be uh, talking today about my PhD research, which I'm conducting at the University of Limerick in Ireland. Um, I don't actually live there. A lot of people seem to be confused. I'm still in Zurich, but uh, in Limerick I have a rather awesome prof, Brian Fitzgerald. Um, he's been doing a lot of stuff in uh, open source research and uh, when I presented him my idea, he was very keen to have me even if I'm not staying at the department. So that's a little bit of background. Um, my working title for the research is uh, Method Diffusion in Large Open Source Projects. And uh, for those of you who have no idea what these individual words mean, well, join the club. This is academia. I feel very much for you. Um, and I will bring you a, a little slide with definitions in just a second. But, uh, well, I guess uh, I do want to apologize that a couple of the words that you're going to encounter on these slides are not necessarily, how should I say, practical. Um, but those of you who know academia know that uh, this isn't my fault. Who of you, uh, by the way, is involved uh, in academia, does academic research? All right, so that's about a little less than half. Okay. So I'll be giving you a short overview, um, look at a little bit of uh, adoptions of tools that have happened or are currently happening in Debian and uh, try to give an overview of my future directions. Now, uh, I don't really know where that's going to lead yet, but uh, we'll get there later. So here are the definitions that I promised. Method diffusion in large open source projects. With method, I simply mean something like a technique or a tool. It could be anything from version control to a new bug tracking system or even an entirely integrated workflow that um, people start adopting in order to produce better software. Um, a diffusion is an introduction of this tool or offset method with the goal of having it adopted by other people. And uh, large project, I had to put that into the title because even though I do want to limit myself mostly to be looking to, to Debian, um, I had to make it a little more generic and I had to put the large project in there simply because uh, the high inertia and the complex self dynamics of large projects such as Debian make this research particularly interesting. I uh, initially thought about looking at various projects, including uh, the Plone and Soap projects, where I'm also a developer, but uh, then in the end decided that they, it would be comparing apples and oranges if you look at Plone and you look at Debian, because just the sheer size of the project makes a big difference. So my motivation or research basis, I came into this initially thinking that, uh, or with this very strong interest in groupware and workflow, um, tools and uh, in thinking that there's a lot of places in the Debian workflow where we could really do with some improvements. Um, when you look at Debian, the methods that we are using have definitely evolved over time, have gotten a lot better, but in the end, it's more or less still the same stuff we've been using three years ago, five years ago, eight years ago. It evolved a little bit further, but we never actually took the time um, to reevaluate and re-implement an entire workflow. So just to give a very simple example, um, if you are maintainer for a package and you receive a bug report, what you have to do is basically interact with that bug report via the bug tracking system. At the same time, somehow fix the bug in your package, which may require you to use a version control system. The version control system, if you're using one, requires you to write a commit message, you also have to write a changelog entry into the um, Debian changelog file explaining what you did and you may also want to write some about your fix into the actual bug report. So these are three different uh, sinks of information where you're putting stuff and uh, even though they are somewhat interlinked, there's for instance the tool dep commit which will take your VCS, change, VCS commit message and sorry, the changelog entry and make a VCS commit message out of it and our DAC suite actually automatically closes bugs that have been um, mentioned in the Debian changelog upon upload. The entire workflow though is very brittle and not integrated. There are plenty of places where you can make mistakes. 
plenty of times uh, when you don't actually create a patch for the fix that you have just introduced into your package, which should ideally be attached to the bug report so that other people, other distributions who are running into the same problem could actually just take your patch and don't have to hackle you for it. So this high interdependence of the methods and uh, the fact that we have been using more or less the same stuff over the last couple of years lead or suggested to me that we're reaching a sort of stagnating efficiency. Now, I, I believe when the first couple of times when I talked to some Debian people about this research and I said something like stagnating efficiency, some of them got up and walked out the room or something, were like very offended. Um, I don't mean it as harsh as it sounds, I guess. Uh, Debian is a very, very good project, a very uh, productive project and incredible in, in what we have achieved and what we continue to achieve every day. But I, th I think that given our manpower, we could be do doing a lot more if we actually didn't have to spend so much time on the little tasks that have to be done, if they could have be somehow better integrated. And lo and behold, we actually do have better methods here and there. For instance, uh, version control seems to be a big topic, and especially the uh, distributed version control methods. Those actually can be used to solve a lot of our problems if we properly integrate them. But of course, there is not only one version control system. The world would be so much easier if it were just BitKeeper, right? And nothing else. Because then your choice would be BitKeeper or not BitKeeper. And everybody in Debian or a large mass would start using BitKeeper. Well, there you go. Perfect. Well, our problem is that we have so many other good alternatives. And we don't really have any way to integrate them. So. Uh, some people may be using Subversion still for their packaging. Other people may be jumping on the Git train and so on and so forth. The problem about that, obviously, is that you're kind of forming clusters that way. Initially, when I was starting this research, I had in my head the idea of the uh, middle-aged person who, on a Saturday afternoon, actually has some free time because the kids are out playing and there are four hours to be spent. And those four hours, that person would like to actually contribute to Debian and make a real difference. But as it is right now, unless you are completely immersed in Debian work every day, those four hours are going to be reduced to pretty much two hours of contribution. Because in the first two hours, you're going to have to try to figure out what it is, uh, how, is it, how are you supposed to actually achieve what you wanted to do. What version control system does the package use that you're trying to fix? How do you actually use that version control system? And then you learned that information. You know how to do it for SVN. And next Saturday, your kids are out again, and you would like to contribute this time. However, the package is maintained in Mercurial. So there you go. You can learn yet another version control system. And from a couple of interviews that I've done with uh, contributors, mainly on fairs, um, even though for us, I guess most people here at, the, at this conference, learning a version control system is somewhat fun, you know, just like configuring your text editor is somewhat fun. Like We are actually playing with our tools. We're geeky enough for that. There are plenty of contributors out there who just don't care. They do not want to contribute to Debian and learn and have to learn a version control system on the way. They just want to contribute to Debian. And we, I think, have to understand that and have to figure out how we can come up with methods that make it a lot easier for people, or a lot more accessible, make our development process a lot more accessible. So my research question actually is, under what circumstances could we get volunteers to use some new methods? And I would like to kind of jump ahead to a slide that I have towards the end. Um, I'm not talking about having a perfect solution to the Debian workflow. I actually started two years ago with this research and I thought, hey, I'm just going to like create this perfect workflow for Debian and then everybody's going to adopt it and we're going to be this awesome project that is just going to be 100% more efficient. But I uh, very quickly gave up, gave up on that because, uh, not because I don't believe that it's possible to introduce something like a perfect workflow or a single workflow by which everyone abides. I mean, we're doing it right now already. We already have one workflow that everybody has to go by. I think it is definitely possible, but I don't think it's within my uh, core competencies. So I'd much rather leave that to someone else and uh, just look at 
the factors that actually deal with the diffusion around it. So I, my hypothesis is that given a diffusion, given a, an unleashing of a tool within Debian, there exists a certain number of characteristics about the tool or about the way it was diffused into the project, about the way that communication was handled or the way that the social system is structured into which it was diffused, which determine largely the rate of adoption by people. Now with rate of adoption I simply mean that S-shaped curve, I'm sure you've seen that in uh, every single, or in, in various statistical um, articles. The, I don't unfortunately don't have it with me right here, but you can basically imagine in the very beginning of any adoption you'll just have a couple of freaks using a tool and then slowly, slowly it starts picking up until you get um, a very steep gradient when everybody kind of keeps jumping onto that train and starts using that tool and then in the end it kind of flattens out again because you, the number of late comers to the party is ever decreasing. Um, if we actually managed to identify these characteristics, managed to be able to say what it is about a tool or about a way that we diffuse that tool that made people adopt it, then I think we can, provided that we come up with a tool or with a workflow, I'll just call it method, we can actually engineer that diffusion to improve the efficiency of the entire process. So, for my research I've chosen uh, a two-tiered approach. Unfortunately, I couldn't just stay with a single one, so this actually requires me to uh, use two different research strategies. And uh, I don't know if you saw my, my bad joke on the very, very first slide, saying that I'm an alien, I'm a computer scientist in the world of sociology. That's actually what's going on. I somehow managed to end up doing a PhD on sociology, and it just kind of happened all too fast, so now I'm in it and I can't really do anything about it. But it also means that I get to do all these like cool research techniques called qualitative research techniques, like case studies and interviews and ethnological stuff. And uh, so, out of the uh, immense selection of uh, research strategies I could pick off, I had to take two for the two phases of this approach. And the first one is basically case studies, and the second one is the participatory action research. I'll uh, tell you what this is all about in just a second. Let me have a look at phase one first, case studies. What do I mean with case studies? Well, I mean looking at previous diffusions. For instance, the diffusion of Depp Helper about nine years ago, or uh, its friend, CDBS, and just trying to identify what kind of factors were surrounding that diffusion. And then we can hopefully say that one tool, one diffusion was a successful diffusion, whereas CDBS may have been a little less successful than Depp Helper. And then I can combine that and come up with statistics, hopefully, qualitative statistics, I love that word, um, to be able to figure out uh, which characteristics actually made this happen. And I'm not going to be the one actually analyzing all these diffusions because I'm just one single person and this is qualitative work so I would be very biased or I'd have very biased research if it was just me. So I'll be doing a, a bunch of interviews with people who uh, overse um, have overseen these diffusions or who have actually engineered them, who have been part of them and figure out whether they were aware of what they're doing or whether they actually remember the um, important facts. There are also usage statistics, obviously PopCon is hopefully going to be of big use to see how quickly people started to adopt it. But on the other hand, uh, it's going to be slightly difficult because I'm talking about development tools and PopCon kind of talks about all of our tools in the archive. And it doesn't necessarily mean that if somebody has Git installed that they're actually a developer. Maybe they just had to once download the free desktop.org archive or something like that. Um, also survey data, I put that into parentheses because I really don't want to be doing a survey. Uh, it's one of the hardest things in qualitative research because the questions have to be perfectly engineered. You, otherwise, it's useless if people could misunder misunderstand what's going on. And uh, it's quite a time-consuming job to get the survey out and then to get feedback back and actually have people participate. It usually stays at a very, very low percentage. So I'll mostly focus on the case studies, actually, and. Uh, 
my mad lead graphical skills have uh, allowed me to come up with this graph. And you'll see on the left side there's these previous diffusions. I'm sorry for the small font, but I uh, didn't remake it for the slides. Previous diffusions and then the analysis, trying to figure, come up with all kinds of facts related, soft facts related to the diffusion. And then um, creating what I call standardized exemplars from it. So uh, sorry for that language, standardized exemplars. Um, it, what I basically mean is a type of framework. Um, you can think of it, or one of the easiest analogies I've come up with is a portfolio, a stock portfolio. Um, that's one sheet of paper, and it has the most important data about a stock. And I want to be using such exemplars or templates or frameworks or whatever you want to call it, so that I can actually put structure into the data so that I can compare two different instantiations of these templates. And if you think about it again in terms of the uh, stock portfolio, if you have two stocks and you have portfolios for each and both of them are issued by the same bank, it's going to be a hell of a lot easier to compare them than if you have two portfolios from different banks because they just have different data and different uh, and, and the facts in different parts. You have a question, there's a microphone. Uh yeah, what examples are you going to have of, um, can you give us an example of one of the temp templates you're going to be using? Well, I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. This is actually where I'm currently at in my research. It's a, it's a very, very difficult part. So with these templates, I hope that I can actually like, identify common lines and condense them into a set of guidelines. And these guidelines um, should then be usable by people if they wanted to get a tool out there, or should at least give them a better idea of how they could do it. And once I have these guidelines, then I'm actually going to um, go to phase two, which is the implementation phase. And uh, let's just skip those bullet points. Here we have these, uh, this wonderfully lovely graphic again. We'll start on the top with the guidelines, and then you enter that action research. Uh, cycle here. Now, action research is a relatively new sociological research strategy, and it basically just means that you are immersed in the field that you're studying. So, if you had to study the uh, diffusion of um, engineered corn seeds with farmers in Iowa, which, by, by the way, was the first sociological study on the diffusion of innovations. If you had to do that, then you wouldn't just write to them or like try to get your data out of journals. You'd actually go to the farmers and work with them and try to understand. So that's what action research is, and that seemed to be the perfect um, choice for me being a Debian developer myself, because I am part of the project, and I can actually get at a lot more information than just what p people studying Debian might be able to get at from the outside. And with information, I don't only mean I can observe different parts much better because I have access to Debian private or something like that. No, I much more mean that I can actually make a change and by th that way gather more information. Maybe uh, just another quick interesting fact. I used to come from the domain of artificial intelligence and robotics, and we have a um, concept that's called situatedness. And basically what it means is that you want to be immersed in your own world. You want to be able to manipulate your own world to be, world to be able to learn about it. And it seems rather obvious. If you put a baby um, in a room and you don't let it touch anything and you don't let it move around, it's not going to be very intelligent when it grows up. But if, you, uh, if that baby, or what babies do, you know, they take everything and, uh, and munch on it and so on and so forth, then they actually start to learn a lot faster about their environment. And action research is very much the same. If you just go and look at Debian and you try to figure out why this is happening or what's going on over there, you're going to have limited information. But if you go there and you actually uh, change stuff, move things around, you'll have a lot better chance of getting at it. So I don't actually, I can't really explain these uh, boxes. I don't think anybody really can, but uh, academics and especially the socio-scientists are very good at creating these graphs that can't be explained. But uh, action research is a five uh, stage process and it basically, um, it, it's cyclical. And it basically just means trying to formulate what it is that you're trying to do, 
looking at what the current state is, trying to come up with a sort of delta, a difference between what's currently going on and what you would like to um, for it to happen, and taking actions, evaluating again um, whether you were actually successful, and then depending on whether you have been successful, decide that adoption has been reached or go around the cycle again, identify the next problem. Oh, that's lovely. Um, all right, so that, these are the two phases, and uh, I hope I didn't bore you too much with the research strategies and the academic background of it. Are there any questions up to this point, other than the one about the templates um, which I'm using? No questions, all right. Then, well, let, let me get to those templates then. Uh, they're sort of called conceptual framework. Um, I try to stay away from the word framework because it's just way too overloaded, but I guess that's what people want to see in a thesis, the conceptual framework. And as I've already seen those templates, think of them as the stock portfolios. Think of them as data sheets that are issued by exactly the same organization to make comparisons easier. Um, there exist many of these frameworks already in sociology and management science. The problem so far is that um, these are usually related to voluntary independent adoption decisions. And with that, I mean these uh, volunteers, like for instance, the corn farmers in Iowa, they have the choice themselves to adopt the engineered corn seeds. If they do it, they don't affect anything else but their, their own crop, their own life. They don't affect their neighbors at all. And well, it's voluntary. Um, on the other hand, in management science usually, what you have is frameworks that try to explain authoritarian, conservative fusions, like a company that goes out and says, well, we're going to be using BitKeeper and everybody has to use it. That's authoritarian and it's concerted because it kind of everyone is supposed to start at the same time. So it's probably accompanied with some form of trainings and so on and so forth. But basically, there's not really anything in between these two extremes. You either have corn farmers in templates or you have poor people working with BitKeeper in a company. For open source software and Debian in particular, um, these won't do. It's uh, way more complex what we are dealing with because uh, there's something in Debian that we call strong network externalities. That's another one of those lovely words where when I first encountered it, I was like, ah, that means nothing to me. And still now that I know what it actually means, it still doesn't really mean anything. Well, a network externality is really something that I'd call an interdependence between actors in a social system. So a high network externality means that if one person starts to use a new method within the social system, that kind of requires a lot of other people to adopt that method as well. For instance, if we were to switch our bug tracking system from Debbox to Bugzilla, don't shoot me, um, that would pretty much require everyone to go ahead and use Bugzilla. So that, in that case, it could be said that it has a very high degree of network externality. Externality. Well, then there's also ideology. Uh, people who actually refuse to use a tool that perfectly does what they want, but unfortunately it's written in Perl and not in Python. There are folks like that. And it's kind of difficult to deal with that, and especially difficult to try to fit that into the existing frameworks. You know, because at a company, nobody's going to say, I'm not using BitKeeper because it was written in C. And the corn farmers are not going to complain that they're not going to use those corn seeds because the container in which they arrived was blue. It doesn't matter to them. But the OSS seems to be a rather weird uh, group of people. There's also this voluntary and cabal type thing. Uh, um, with that, what I mean is basically that uh, you have a, something called opinion leaders. Um, you, you as a single developer may have the choice of using a tool, but you may also see like this group of highly influential people um, who are all deciding that Git is the way to go now, and they all start adopting Git, and they sort of like, there's this sort of like Kabbalistic type of feel to it, like those are the, the cool people and they're using that, and then that builds up a very, very strong motivation for the individual to actually 
adopt that tool as well. And these forms of uh, decisions on an individual level, they just aren't made among corn farmers and they aren't made among people who are working in, uh, in managed corporations. So I'll give you a very quick example of one framework that actually exists and it's the most famous one. This is a work by Everett M. Rogers who uh, was basically the person to first formalize this uh, concept of diffusion of innovations. Um, and he was exactly the person that did the study on the corn seed, on the corn farmers in Iowa. And what Rogers did was basically try to do exactly what I'm doing, try to come up with certain uh, factors, characteristics that could be used to describe and analyze diffusions. And uh, this is his famous framework, and that framework has probably been applied more to more than 3,000 I can't, I can't remember whether it's 2,000 or 3,000, but it's definitely more than 2,000 um, studies. So it's definitely very verified, and I cannot ignore it just like that, even though, to be honest, I would much rather ignore it. Um, it is very generic in that it can be used to describe pretty much any diffusion from corn seeds to uh, open source software, but it may not actually fit perfectly with each. But uh, he has four different categories, the innovation, communication process, the social system, and then the consequences. And then with each ca category, within each category, you can see these uh, um, different characteristics. For instance, the innovation itself, the new method that is to be diffused, um, does it have an advantage over what I'm currently using? And if so, then is it not complex? Is it compatible with my current work? Can I actually try it out? And is it well documented? Is it visible? Um, can I find out about it easily? Is there an com active community behind it? Those factors tend to influence a lot whether people will see an innovation as being something or even consider the innova innovation. And then there's stuff like communication, mass versus interpersonal media. Um, that's very interesting actually to look at at what phases in the in, um, adoption process which type of communication is more efficient. For instance, in the beginning, um, you don't have to try to do interpersonal communication to get people to int uh, interested in the tool that you just developed last weekend, because what you're going to be doing is just going around from one person to another and start preaching to them the same stuff over and over again, and you're not going to have any effect. In the beginning, it's definitely mass communication, but later on, when, let's say, 35% adoption rate has been reached, what you then need is actually interpersonal communication. And that has been delivered in terms of training, or that has been delivered in terms of uh, conferences like here, where people come up to each other and are like, please explain this to me, or let me show you my cool new toy. And then actually spread the toy even further. Well, I won't go much further into these uh, individual characteristics, because well, I could talk a lot about them. But uh, you get the picture, I hope, of what these uh, what the framework is. So uh, before I move on, ask your question, please. So I just wanted to check, would you, would you or would you not agree that a basic summary of what that is trying to achieve is to ask the question, or to, two questions, does the, um, does it contribute to the goal, or does it aggravate the goal? Each of those things, compatibility, complexity, is it contribute to the goal, or does it, or does it aggravate it? Is, would, would you agree with that? Um, yes and no. It's, it's one of the questions that you asked, but you said you had a second one anyway. And well, to, just to quickly answer, um, absolutely, however, within the social system that we're studying, it doesn't matter often to people. The other day, I was sitting here in the hack lab and I was trying to uh, actually get some work done and there was a guy sitting next to me continuously swearing because he didn't manage to get the work done that he wanted in the last one and a half hours because he wasn't understanding what Git was telling him. And he had just started to use Git an hour earlier. So instead of giving up on Git and actually doing the work he wanted to do, he just kept beating his head on the table until he understood it. So it's, it's slightly, 
you know, it is definitely incompatible, it's complex and so on, but that doesn't really stop people. It just kind of influences. You can't reduce it to that. But you had a second question. No, it wasn't a second question. It was just um, the two parts um, to ah, okay. a, a, analyzing thing. Sort of the, que the, quest, the first question was, you know, for example, on the, uh, um, it, it, the let's pick one, um, on the innovation, somebody has an idea which they believe, an innovative idea which they believe helps uh, achieve the goal, um, or the, the innovation is that they think that Git is better. Um, it does, the, um, does what they are trying to do to achieve that goal contribute or to contribute to the goal, or does it aggravate the goal? Does the person contribute to the goal? Does the person aggravate the goal? It's the, it's the key question in each of those things. The communication thing that somebody's trying to do, does it contribute to the goal of getting to the thing, or is, is the person yapping away and bashing their head against the table? Is it aggravating the, the overall goal? So, no, it's just sort of a thing. Each of those things, it seems to me that it fits those, you know, that each of those two questions, it right. seems to, seem to fit. Yeah, well, that well, that's definitely thing. true. Uh, whether, because in the end, if people manage to stay uh, clear and keep in their heads what they're actually trying to do, then that really applies. But what I was telling you earlier is that that's not always the case. Uh, sometimes people will actually force themselves to use VI. I remember when I started with VI, I was just like, VI, that's the coolest editor. I have to start using it. My productivity was down for like three weeks before I actually started to understand it. And it happens all the time, but you're absolutely right um, that each one of these actually can be uh, split, or you can look at them in terms of that dichotomy that you uh, just identified. But as I said, this, is, this, ex this framework does not do. I can't use this. I tried with like about eight different adoptions that we had in, in Debian, and I couldn't there weren't any, once I, once I analyzed all these adoptions and then fit them into the template and then sorted um, those that I considered to be successful into one pile and those that I considered to be non-successful into another, there weren't any substantial differences between the data on sheets in this pile and the data in sheets in this pile. And that's the hope that I have that I, you can find these characteristics. Obviously, you know, um, some of them were different. Uh, like, maybe, maybe even uh, something like compatibility for Debian is rather important. The tools that were successful were all compatible. I don't actually know whether this is true, but let's assume it for a second. They were all compatible with what you're doing currently, and the tools that were unsuccessful were all incompatible. So that is actually a factor that you want to consider, that that factor determines whether a diffusion is going to be successful or not. But it's definitely not going to be the only factor. And for all the other factors listed here, the distinction wasn't as clear. You'd have 50% verifiability in that and also in that pile. So you couldn't use verifiability as a, as a distinguishing method between success and failure of an adoption. Well, Try to come up with uh, the problems, and it's, it's rather hard to formalize them, but the two most important problems that seem to prevent me from using Roger's framework, as well as any of the other classical diffusion frameworks that are being in use in management science and sociology, is basically that the low degree of network externalities that they study, so whenever a decision was made by an individual in the studies where these uh, frameworks were used, it didn't affect anyone else. And for us in Debian, that's definitely not the case. And uh, prior information not required, that's some, a point that I haven't raised yet. Um, no, none of the farmers really did need to know just how this corn was engineered. Because for them, it was just corn seeds. They would go out to the field and put them under the ground and then like do whatever they do and harvest the corn after a little while. There was no prior information required. If we are trying to get version control into Debian, for instance, just let's assume for a minute we'll make everything in Debian version control based, then not only does that require every single Debian developer to learn the basic concepts of version control, which I assume everybody kind of knows, so then only has to learn the front end, has to learn how Git or how Mercurial is used. Um, it also requires us that our 
let's say 2,500 other contributors, translators, people interested, finding bugs and so on and so forth, have to do exactly the same. And they aren't as close to development as we are, so they may not actually know about version control. So we're asking them to learn an, a very complex topic just so that they can help us get further with our project. And uh, that's definitely a factor that we have to put in. And none of the frameworks that I've looked at in management science and sociology actually have that in there. So uh, I fought and fought and uh, ended up losing because now I actually have to go and design my own framework. And I'll hopefully be able to do that by cherry picking stuff like verifiability or compatibility from other frameworks and assemble them. But the big problem is when you do data classification in the way that I do it, and especially in a, in a qualitative type of way, what you really want is for these different categories to be orthogonal to each other so that verifiability is completely independent from compatibility. Because otherwise, you'll, you'll have analysis or you can have an analysis that actually isn't based on the characteristics but, but sort of like on the stuff that is in between and it won't allow you to come up with some clear results. So um, that's a very, very time-consuming process and I have been on that for the last three months and actually was hoping that I would have something done, a final uh, framework for the StepConf to present to you, but it just hasn't happened. It's, uh, it's way more involved than I th initially thought, but that's always, I guess that's uh, what Hofstetter's law, it, everything takes twice as long as you think, even if you take into account Hofstetter's law or something like that. But I did spend a lot of time thinking about this, and these are some of the ideas that are uh, OSS specific or, well, relevant to open source software, which aren't found in, or aren't all found in the, uh, in the other frameworks that I looked at. So, for instance, the method of development is a centralized uh, one person fighting with patches in their mailbox, or is it actually using a version control system, and which language is it written in? That plays an important factor to some people, whether they end up using it. Um, and that is related in some ways to, uh, let's see, the responsiveness of the author as well as the flexibility and uh, the accessibility for re-innovators. Um, because many of, us, many of us start using a tool and then kind of become developers very quickly because the tool doesn't do exactly what we want it to do, or there's a bug that we find in exactly the same the use case that I have, which the original author didn't. And so we kind of become co-developers. And for co-developers, it's, it's very important to have that factor in there, like how quickly does the author actually respond to bugs and how quickly are they fixed? How uh, short is the length of release cycles? Um, is it easy for me to actually get new features in there that maybe only I use? Is it well documented? That's actually, uh, some people seem to think that's very important. I, I can't say anything about documentation. It's really weird. Sometimes documentation is everything. That'll get the tool adopted. And in more than more cases, actually, documentation is quite the opposite. Um, good examples, for instance, are uh, I don't, want to, I don't want to slay any project here because I certainly tip my hat to every project that has documentation. My projects never do. But uh, for instance, the... Uh, uh, can't come up right now. I think, I think, for instance, the Git documentation. So three pages, introductory tutorial, straightforward. It's very easy to read. Whereas if you look at the Samba tutorial, uh, the Samba how-to or uh, documentation. It's a massive book. It's very good. I'm not saying that the Samba documentation is bad, but when you first encounter Samba and you look at that tome, you're kind of like intimidated by it sometimes. And that intimidation can happen at such an early stage of the adoption process that you don't even consider adopting that software anymore simply because you were intimidated at first sight. Steiner? Yeah, uh, I think it's kind of funny that you're pulling out the Git documentation as a positive thing. My main reason for not using it was at a time when I was using documentation sucked, and it was really hard to find. So it will be funny to see if like, the availability of that documentation is what we will be driving it forward or not. 
Right. Maybe Git was a bad example, um, but I hope I still made the point kind of clear. Um, you're right. I, I think that a year ago, um, the Git documentation was really bad, and it has gotten a lot better. So it would be that's exactly the kind of stuff that I'm looking for. Like, has the increase in available good documentation, in, in to what degree was it responsible for the increase of users? Um, well, I'll, I don't really need to go into every single one of these characteristics because I think most of them are quite obvious to you. Um, I do want to highlight one, one point quickly, uh, the manifesto. Many of you know that I started writing NetConf here at DevCamp, and uh, I actually spent the weeks before DevCamp, or even the months before DevCamp, um, writing design documents. And these design documents, I don't know what a design document exactly is, or like whether there is a structure, how you write it, but I always found myself like identifying what's the problem that I'm trying to fix, and why do I want to fix it? What do I think I can do, and how do I intend to do it? And that document kind of, uh, well, a lot of people thought that I'm like the opposite of an extreme programmer. I'm sort of like the uh, lover of the waterfall model. And in some ways, it's true. But I also found that it's impossible to do anything complex without having a pretty good idea before that. Unless, of course, you become an extreme, extreme programmer, and you're ready to rewrite every single line about 25 times before you get anywhere in, within the project. And uh, when I talked to Joey Hess, who is, uh, as many of you will know, one of the main, uh, or one of the, he's definitely the author of uh, Dev Helper and uh, some other tools that have reached wide adoption. So uh, I talked to him and I had some questions to ask because I'm genuinely interested out of the, the research and how he does it or whether he's aware that he's doing this kind of stuff. And uh, he said that the manifesto, the design document, is probably the one uh, piece of advice he would give to anyone starting a project. Write down what you're trying to solve and how you're going to solve it, and then start solving it. Because not only does that get you straight on track, it also gives people a more abstract idea of what this is about, whether they should actually bother to get involved in the project or not. Um, just for completeness, is there anything that you would think of that is an important factor determining whether an adoption will happen or not, which is not on this list? Uh, a charter and vision statement. Sorry, um, a vision? A char charter and vision statement. OK, it's that's kind of what I meant with <coughs> manifesto. Uh, yeah, but, but also, um, again, um, if you're a group, uh, the, the Ubuntu vision statement is absolutely fantastic. Um, and I've also seen another one, which isn't to do with free software, but the Unity Guild World of Warcraft uh, uh, vision statement and, and, um, and charter are absolutely fantastic. Because they say things like, you, both those t two things, the Ubuntu vision statement and charter and the World of Warcraft Unity Guild um, charter, say, we will look after people. You won't do this. When you get to a certain level in, 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 um, in the Unity Guild, you are expected to take a certain amount of responsibility. So experience automatically um, transfers responsibility. Um, really very, very, very interesting thing. It's, 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 it's a communication. It's about encouraging communication between the people. Well, I think that's a, that's a very interesting point. Um, if I go back to that framework for a second, one thing I have to say about it, though, is that it seems to be applicable to the social system mostly. So uh, if it's an Ubuntu vision statement, then it is basically about the social system that Ubuntu has uh, collected, and the same with that World of Warcraft guild. Um, the problem with this category, social system, which my framework will also have, it's just not going to be exactly the same, is that this is actually more or less static across all template instantiations, because we are more or less still within the same social system. Obviously, there are going to be slight differences there. Uh, if, if I look at the Debian installer team, for instance, that's more or less a, a separate social system. Um, it's, it's a sub-social system. Uh, not sub-social, 
but a, a subsystem of the. Well, okay, I better uh, move on now. <laughs> I hope you understand what I mean. Okay, well, I talked about the adoption process. Uh, did I, were there any other questions or any other input on that slide? All right. I talked about the adoption process. Um, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, well, first of all, that you can, I'll have a link to my webpage in a second, but uh, there's also this uh, wiki page that I started about uh, eight, ten months ago or something like that, where I asked a couple of, uh, or everyone, every developer to provide their input on what they thought um, were the important characteristics of a diffusion such as CDBS or uh, any other build tool. There are quite a lot of them. The uh, responses were pretty impressive. And uh, I didn't set up network now. Well, I guess I could quickly. But uh, sure. So uh, the, the responses were actually quite astonishing, and uh, we quickly had to even create subcategories. I think I started out this wiki page with like four tools on it, wanting to get feedback on those four tools. And now you can see that we have uh, nine subcategories. So uh, for instance, Dev Helper, which everyone knows, um, people have provided input on it. And it's exactly this kind of data that I will be needing and looking at. And uh, if you're interested and you have an opinion on any of the uh, adoptions that have happened in the past or you think that there are some tools that should really be mentioned, I would appreciate if you took the time and put some stuff, some of the information on the wiki. All right. Now, I don't have much time left and I also don't want to be running into the last second. So just some points to clear up here. Uh, when I initially, when I started with this research, I would talk about engineering diffusions according to some guidelines, and well, some people were like, "Are you a fascist?" or like, "Are you trying to take over Debian? Um, are you going to like end like do some social engineering on the tool level, on the method level, to eventually like uh, take over the project?" And of course, that's not the case. Um, and uh, with engineered guidelines, what I what I don't mean is, uh, let me see this one. I'm, I'm not, I don't have the method that is the solution to all of our problems, and I'm ready to engineer that, whether you like it or not. It's not that kind of that thing, but I, th I think that within Debian, we're very, very innovative. For instance, like uh, here at DevConf, a lot of projects have started or have completed, just to name one, Meta in it, um, a project that tries to address the fact that there are more than sysv in it. There are also dependency RC and so on and so forth. And even though we have uh, update RCD and invoke RCD, which is our current meta in it, that, that stuff is old. And it doesn't deal with uh, newer innovations such as upstart. So we can't use it for upstart, which is perfectly all right replacement for the init system. And so now meta in it is coming up with ways in which we can abstract to the point where ups, upstart and sysv in it are exactly the same initialization frameworks. And uh, given such an innovation made by someone else, I hope that these guidelines that I provide can be used to make them um, spread faster. And I hope that these guidelines will help to do that. Ideally, I would love to have uh, a document that sort of, uh, in the spirit of uh, Enrico's step tags and apt cache work, kind of gives you a, a sorted list of factors. Like if you if you spend the same amount of work on 
improving the documentation, it would get you 23% more adoption than if you spent the same amount of time on, uh, on doing something like uh, whatever else. But uh, that's not going to be possible, unfortunately. It, I would need to collect maybe a thousand different uh, template instantiations and I'm also doing qualitative research, so there is not really any statistical stuff to be done. Um, it would be nice to have it like that, and I guess in the end, what I will produce is a, a document that, that you can treat more or less as a how-to, and within that how-to, some of the uh, factors will definitely be listed first if they are if they have most impact, but uh, it's not going to be quantitative. All right, and then just as a last slide, um, I'm very interested in this topic. Not because now I can finally do sociology, or it's a sociological topic, but because my interest has always been in workflow and management. And one thing that I've noticed, and from talking to a couple of managers at companies actually uh, was confirmed in, is that it seems that nowadays modern management makes employees more like volunteers. Uh, you're at that company, somebody is actually telling you what to do, you're also getting paid by that company, but in the end, the actual management, the, uh, the environment in which you're working is more like a volunteer. Like People are happy if you show up, but you can also stay at home. You kind of manage your own day as long as you deliver, and so on and so forth. And I guess if these guidelines happen to be successful within open source, which is very complex, probably more complex than companies, they're definitely going to have some impact on management side as well. All right. That's it from me. I thank you very much for your attention. Are there any questions or any other input? Yes, Jeremy? Um, what about real, real life? I mean, what about have you, have you tried to look at how much uh, impact had a real life meeting on some an adoption of a new tool? I'm, I, I didn't understand that. Could you? What about real life meeting meetings for like you know um, how real life meetings affects? Our oh, real life meetings. Ah. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess you can look at meetings as a form of tool, as a form of method. Absolutely. That's, yeah, that's actually an interesting point. Although it's going to be hard to argue that they're non-productive, it might also be hard to argue that they are productive, given DevConf, you know. All right, thanks. I'll write that down. Is there anyone else? Any other input? Yes? Thanks. Thanks. Okay. One thing um, I've recently uh, become aware of, which I, w I, w I wanted to put, to put to you to consider um, as part of your research, is in any communication that's going on, how much of it focuses on the past and how much of it focuses on the future? Any communication, whether it be IRC or email or face-to-face -face meetings, how much of it goes over old stuff and how much of it goes on? Do you have a hypothesis? Do you, do you have a, like a, a well, question? Would you say that like projects that talk more about the future are going to be more successful or any, any of that? Like, wh where do you think does that come in? Basically, yes. Um, uh, for, for example, um, talking to Phil, Phil Hans, he came up with the idea of creating a, um, a, a filter for POP3 for mailing lists, an optional filter, right, where people can um, uh, say whether, uh, um, whether something is useful or whether it isn't. And then, so you, it's like a spam filter, useful, not useful. And so, um, if people start discussing stuff in the in of uh, in flame wars about yeah you uh, stole my cow from my grandfather's blah 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 whatever the thing, um, uh, and uh, you deserve to uh, be cut off completely, 
um, uh, sort of thing. It's just not useful. Right. Um, and but some people might want to listen or read to all that, read all that stuff. So you can't apply it across the board. So what I wanted to do was to set up a, pop, a, pop, a, a, a suggestion was to set up a, a, a filter which people can apply to the mailing list if, if they choose, which from which they can cut out all of the all of this yeah. not useful to okay, start. I mean that what you're talking about right now is is kind of communication as a method of development, um, or the communication medium. So there definitely. Uh, that will have features like usability, for instance, I guess uh, being flooded with spam or flame wars is usability type issue. Um, so that's definitely interesting. I'll mark that down right next to real life meetings. Seems to be uh, related even. All right. Thanks very much for your input. Uh, is there any, any other input? All right. Then I don't really want to keep you any longer. Thanks for your attention and uh, have a good lunch. <laughs>